Welcome to another episode of Special Edition Sandwich as we prepare for our 2019 annual town meeting. Today we want to talk a little bit about the possible municipal office consolidation and the acquisition of 100 Route 6A. Joining me are my colleagues, Mr. Bud Dunham, Sandwich Town Manager, and Doug Lapp, Assistant Town Manager. Hello gentlemen, how are you today? Good Dave, how are you? I'm doing great. So uh, we just want to talk a little bit about what is happening with Article 1, um, help people get prepared for town meeting. Uh, the three of us have done a lot of collaboration together uh, to prepare to make sure that we have all the right information to present to the voters, but I want to make sure that they have the opportunity to have a little bit of a head start before they get to town meeting, and uh, that's the goal of our, our show today. All right. So let's take a look at a little bit about what is inside Article 1. Yeah, at its simplest, Article 1 seeks to purchase the property at 100 Route 6A, which is the former Santander Bank building. It's uh, roughly four acres of land, uh, 15,000 square feet, um, and what the intent would be was would be to convert that space into general municipal offices. And uh, based on the work that we've done and the price that we've negotiated, the sale price would be $2.1 million, and the estimated repairs are right around $1.85 million, so for a grand total of uh, $3,950,000. Um, based on everything we've looked at, uh, we should be able to fit parts of 15 entirely or parts of 15 different offices uh, which comprise of 51 positions in town in that one building. So it would greatly consolidate our services, be able to provide more in, uh, efficient operations, and primarily provide a lot of uh, customer service to the members of the public. Um, and then in addition, the article seeks two other things, and that's permission to sell both the Town Hall Annex at 145 Main Street and the Jan Sebastian Office Building, which is located at 16 Jan Sebastian Drive. Yeah, and I think that's really important to, to highlight. So I think there's some confusion about which uh, personnel and which offices are, would be going to 100 Route 6A. So it is all the personnel from the Town Hall, the Town Hall Annex, and the Jan Sebastian Building. Yep, and then we'd also pull in um, our IT staff, which is located at uh, Oak Crest Cove. And then also we have one individual from the Facilities Department who currently works at Town Hall that would current, you know, continue to work with us. Okay. I think that, that makes a lot of sense. And I think one of the things that's really important to recognize here is that not only are we looking to acquire the 100 Route 6A property, but we'd also be asking permission to sell the properties we'd be vacating as part of the same request, which really makes this a very comprehensive plan. I think it helps financially too, obviously, because from the sale proceeds, we'd be able to set that money aside and use it to hold down our debt expenses in the future. Right. Now the existing buildings that we have at Jan Sebastian as well as the Town Hall Annex, what is the current state of those buildings? You want to do that? Or sure. Yeah. So uh, the building, the Town Hall Annex, uh, needs a lot of work. And so we've done our best to um, continue keeping the building safe and functional for the public, but we've not wanted to invest a lot of money in some of the higher cost repairs need to be done with the hope that someday you know we could reconsolidate our town offices into one building like we're proposing now. So uh, we've done our best, um, but if this uh, proposed consolidation does not occur, there will be significant amounts of investment that we'll have to make uh, to make the building a healthy place for the long term. Uh, Jan Sebastian Drive, uh, there's also some deferred maintenance that we've uh, intentionally not invested in again with the hope that we can consolidate. If, if we're not able to do that, we'll be looking at replacing more mechanical systems, more of the building envelope. All in, it'll be hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars for both buildings combined in the near future if we're not able to consolidate. Right, and I think, you know, I was thinking a little bit about our, our neighbors earlier today and other municipalities, and I think the two of you probably have more experience, but, you know, I couldn't think of another municipality that's operating on a similar model with having folks in such disparate locations. Yeah, it's, you know, it's common to have things like police and fire stations, DPW operations at different buildings. But for the most part, in almost any other town that we're familiar with on Cape Cod has all the other departments located in one building. This wouldn't completely accomplish that, but it would go a long way towards addressing what you know, has been a weakness in Sandwich for many decades. Yeah, and one of the other interesting things, I think so, if we were to think about those buildings that need investment, you know, we'd basically be continuing to invest in a poor operating model. And then at the same time, you know, a lot of our residents compare our tax rates to our neighbors, and, and none of our neighbors are 
operating like we do. Um, it, it's really not a model geared towards any level of efficiency or to maximize the capacity of our staff. Yeah, I know we're going to talk about it a little bit later, but what really brought that home is we did a study of all of the different foot traffic that we've had, uh, the telephone calls that we receive, and it really shows you that um, what we're trying to do to focus people at one building at 100 Route 6A, you know, the five or six departments that get the most walk-up traffic would all be on the first floor in one building. You wouldn't have to go between three and four different office locations. Right. You know, and, and you know, it's interesting timing the way that this opportunity yeah. has come about for the town. Um, you know, not only is the is a building for sale that would work well, but also from a funding perspective, we actually have the opportunity to pay for it. Maybe you want to talk a little bit about how that works and how we can accomplish that with effectively not really raising yeah. tax rate for our residents. Yeah. So um, the unique thing that you talked about was the new creation of the canal unit number three at the canal power station near the uh, marina. And so with that new unit number three, we negotiated a payment in lieu of tax agreement uh, with the then owners that the property has now changed hands, but they are honoring what our agreement was. So the first year that payments kick in, which will be starting on July 1st, over the course of the year, we'll bring in just over $3.55 million from uh, what technically gets uh, accounted for as a local receipt under the Department of Revenue regulations. So, in it, so that's $3.55 million there. And then the remainder of what we're trying to uh, do to purchase this property and to improve it, the other $400,000 would come from our free cash or our certified surplus revenue, which was at the end of the year. So technically, neither of those sources of revenue are from people's tax bills. Now, someone could make the argument the $400,000 from the free cash um, could be used for other things. So even if you do the reverse math on $400,000, you know, for a one-time payment for the average uh, family home in town, it would equate to $38. So for a one-time payment of $38, um, you know, we're able to buy this property in one fell swoop without having to issue debt um, and to be able to make the improvements. And that doesn't even factor in the roughly million that we'd likely get from selling those two other properties. Right, and what do you think that looks like. So, you know, obviously we asked for permission at town meeting. We're successful with Article 1. We have the opportunity to sell those two buildings. What do the timelines look like potentially yeah. for something like that? So we've, we've already issued a request for qualifications to hire an architect to do all the final design and construction oversight uh, that would be needed for the, the building that we're hoping to acquire, the former bank. So we've, we've already advertised that to get the ball rolling. Uh, if it does not pass a town meeting, then we'll obviously cancel that procurement. Um, but assuming it passes, we'll get working right away with an architect on those plans. Uh, it'll take a couple of months to finalize the work with the architect, finalize the construction documents, put it out to bid. Uh, once that goes out to bid, uh, it could obviously take, I don't have an exact time frame, six months to maybe eight months, closer to a year, I'm not sure, depending on availability of contractors to get that work done. During that time, we can issue a request for proposals uh, to sell the other two buildings that we have. That's been a question that has been asked a few times. Why don't we sell our buildings first you know, before we acquire a new building? And there's a couple of obvious points there. One is we can't dispose of the building that we need and we have people working in until they have somewhere else to go. And we also don't want to do that yet, not knowing if we have the ability to acquire the new building. So I think you know, we've, we've already started the process of getting an architect on board. Um, and then we would work through the design, work through the construction, and during that period of time, do the RFPs to sell the other buildings, and then commence all that, uh, move in. And, and maybe I'll tie in one point also um, that you spearheaded in the, in the town budget, in the capital budget. We're looking at uh, a capital item that would dramatically reduce the amount of paper that we're going to be using, keeping, and moving from Jan Sebastian Drive uh, going over to the new building if we're successful. We would digitize and scan literally a million different pieces of paper. Um, and then the, all those documents could be shredded and destroyed afterwards. So not only would we be streamlining our personnel and our physical space, we'd be bringing a lot less paper with us and setting up our systems in a way to be more paperless and efficient in the future. Right, which just makes a ton of sense for everybody, and I'm, I'm sure that nobody at, at the uh, offices will miss having to search those papers when they're trying to find town records. Mm -hmm. exactly. um, but you know, one of the things that has come up is, you know, we look at the wing school, 
as a, as a potent, possible example of why it's hard to sell a building. And you know, I really think that's just not a fair comparison, right? It's apples to oranges. The buildings we're talking about liquidating here, the Jan Sebastian Drive building, a uh, very marketable property. Uh, I don't know of a lot of property at all that's for sale in the Sandwich Industrial Park. And I think one of the particular interesting points about that building is not just the building, there's a big piece of land there as well, about 1.6 acres or so, I believe, right? Yes, that's right. I mean, it's certainly not a fair comparison uh, to the Wing School. I mean, at, you know, the Wing School is enormous, um, you know, 150,000 square feet or, or something close to that. And there's a lot of hazardous materials that are embedded in some of the newer additions, which have to be, you know, abated during any sort of demo. And that cost alone is millions of dollars without even doing any real renovation or new improvements. So, and, and that those, that size, scale, uh, and dynamic is not at play in the Town Hall Annex or the Jan Sebastian Drive building. So I agree with you, they're much more marketable and will be much more easily able to be uh, sold, I think. And I think if you look at the Jan Sebastian building, like you had said, it doesn't even sit halfway back on the property. So there's room there for if a private business purchased it to expand operations. Uh, many of the uh, commercial entities in the industrial park need parking. Um, lot, that could all be expanded. And for perspective, it only has 6,000 square feet of office space. If you ever go in there, there's literally not a dedicated meeting room. You know, people are sitting right on top of each other. We have the assessing department relocated there from the basement of the annex, which makes absolutely no sense why our financial departments aren't together and have never been able to be together under one roof. Uh, we're definitely the only town that I'm aware of that has that set up. Um, and in the annex, uh, similarly, it's less than 2,000 square feet. Um, you know, combined there's 8,000 square feet and we're looking at roughly 15,000 at, at the 100 Route 6A property. So we could really, um, although things will be tight, they'll be very efficient and we'll have space for the right offices to be near each other and working in the same building. All right, which then also, you know, not just from that efficiency, being able to work together, there's job sharing opportunities, yeah. there's collaboration opportunities, yeah. um, you know, just the opportunity for folks like yourselves to meet with people from other departments without having to drive across town or you know, someone from the IT department not having to drive across town. And we'll talk a little bit about what those potential statistics look like yeah. of who shows up where, but yeah. um, you know, just from collaboration on a day-to-day -day basis, this couldn't make more sense really. And just general oversight you know, in, in our two roles, it's critical you know, to be able to be aware of what's going on and we do it as best we can now. Certainly being in the same building gives us a lot more opportunity to do that and to share things. If we have something related to one of the inspections offices, we can walk right across the hall and talk to them, which would be great. We have that luxury with a couple of departments at, at Town Hall, and I don't think it's a coincidence that we have great relations with those departments mm -hmm. because we're there and we see them every day. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So what happens with the current Town Hall? That's one of the big questions that the people yeah. keep asking. Sure, well, I think the first thing we should be very clear to remind folks is that we're not proposing to sell Town Hall, because despite right. how many times we said that, that you know, still come up. Uh, the primary focus of the second floor of the auditorium will remain exactly as it is now, but only better. And I say that because all the board and committee meetings would remain the same. So all the board of selectmen meetings, finance committee meetings, school committee meetings, and other sort of random public meetings that occur, those will, that's really the primary focus and that'll remain. There's also a lot of other types of arts and culture functions which happen on that second floor auditorium. Art shows, uh, music, uh, dance, that type of thing. All those type of events uh, can continue and in fact actually be improved on because now they're not really able to do that during normal Monday to Friday working hours because of all the office functions that are happening downstairs. So now they'll be opened up to all different times of day during the week. And also we've had to use the stage on the second floor of Town Hall as a kind of makeshift conference room because we didn't have any conference rooms available downstairs. And as a result of that, any kind of artistic performances couldn't have any kind of sets uh, to, to remain on the stage for any length of time. And that was really a disinhibitor for any of the larger performances because they had to be set up and broken down the same night every time. So by us relocating, the stage will be able to have much better sets uh, and to, will enable more performances and, and more functions to happen upstairs. Yeah, and it's interesting you mentioned that because not long after I was elected, I was getting those phone calls from the performance company saying, geez, yeah. we, we can't leave our sets here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, you know, it's the challenge of trying to repurpose the same space right. for different use every single day. Exactly. Yeah. And, 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 oh, I'm sorry. And you said the stage gets used constantly during the day. Um, 
you know, there's no private place on the first floor for people to meet. So if someone is coming in to talk about a sensitive tax title issue with the town treasurer, they go upstairs. When our auditors are in for a couple months of year doing the annual audit, they go upstairs. Um, when we have larger meetings at town hall, we often meet on the stage because I think the, the next biggest size table we have, you know, comfortably, comfortably seats six people and many times we've got 15 or 20 in on a meeting. So. Um, we would have that capability at the bank building at 100 Route 6A, but we uh, wouldn't need to go back to town hall for a lot of those meetings other than the night meetings that Doug mentioned that we do today. So that part, as he said, is going to function the exact same, if not better, than it is currently. Right, so all of our selectman meetings, school yep. committee meetings, those types of meetings that take place there today will still be there as they always have been. So there will be no large public meeting room as part of the 100 Route 6A property. Exactly. Right. And, and I should highlight along that point, you know, one of the questions we've received is, well, if we were going to look at this new initiative to, to relocate and consolidate, why did we, quote unquote, waste that money rehabilitating Town Hall? And I guess the point is, it certainly wasn't a waste because we, were, we preserved and, and uh, rehabilitated, you know, an icon in town and, you know, the first um, general municipal Town Hall created in the Commonwealth in 1834. But the primary purpose of that was the preservation of the second floor auditorium for the same use that we're using it for now, which are public meetings. And so that was the primary focus, making it accessible um, and just shoring up and rehabilitating uh, the space. Um, maybe I can touch on the first floor a little bit, yeah, if that's all right. exactly. Um, and I think it's important to recognize, too, based on what you were saying with the renovations, the renovations of the, you know, re rehabilitating the second floor, refurbishing the first floor really wasn't towards changing town operations right. other than improving I think as a similar layout office space um, before yeah, the same building and same offices stayed there but we actually lost usable office space when the renovations were done because as Doug was saying the prior building didn't have proper handicap accessibility didn't have proper access with the upstairs being renovated we actually lost some usable space on the first floor so we made the best of it and we'll continue to do so yeah and I don't want to lose the first floor but I think one of the other advantages of 100 Route 6A is it's fully ADA accessible. There's, there's an Correct. elevator there, there's parking available, there's sidewalks. <coughs> um, you know, all of our residents will be able to enter and exit that facility without issue. That's right, and that will be a dramatic improvement from our current state at, at the Town Hall Annex and Chan Sebastian Drive, where we're really not fully accessible, unfortunately. Uh, the first floor of Town Hall, you know, some of the ideas that we've talked about is relocating uh, the archives from the library. One of the benefits of relocating the archives is that it would free up the McKnight Room, which is overloaded right now, and that would really allow that space to be better programmed for the library. We've also looked at having an office space for the selectmen to have their meetings, meetings with constituents in Town Hall. And then lastly, kind of going back in time, the original use of Town Hall, back when it was constructed, again, there were public meetings on the second floor. First floor was actually leased out and rented out to all different types of private businesses for a variety of different uses. So I think another option that on the first floor, uh, we could look at different types of tourist uh, and tourist uh, business related activities on that first floor um, and it could really be a, an asset to, uh, to our economy. Yeah, and it's interesting if you look at that history there was lamp makers in there and carpentry shops and exactly. dry goods uh, merchants and things like that mm -hmm. which I think is pretty pretty interesting um, but also you think about the available parking there and things like that it could be a very good use of the space. Exactly. So I know that we did some activity tracking uh, to try to identify how many people are coming to our town offices on a regular basis and during the month of March all of our uh, town staff members kind of ran tally sheets yeah. to try to identify where those numbers come together. Can you kind of give us a little bit of a highlight of how many people we're servicing and, and I know that the data that we have it's our internal customers so our, our own interactions with each other from a staff perspective as well as our external customers from the community. Yeah so we didn't track emails at all what we asked people to do was track phone calls walk up traffic and meetings that they would hold during the day and so uh, every person in those 15 departments that I had mentioned previously was asked to go ahead and track that for the month of March. And it's important to point out that uh, there were uh, there was a period when motor vehicle excise bills were due, but it wasn't a huge month in terms of when tax bills were due. So the collector's office got a huge walk-up numbers, but 
Um, it would have been even bigger if we had done it, say, in one of the months mm -hmm. when tax bills were due. But to cut to the chase, between the 15 different departments for those activities that I mentioned, it was over 10,000 trips or phone calls or meetings that were held in each of those offices during that month-long period. So when you extrapolate that out for a year, it's over 120,000 visits or phone calls that happen, many of them between offices. Uh, some with the public, like you had mentioned, and it is unique because certain departments, for example, human resources and our uh, financial director's office and the accounting office, if you think about it, they serve more internal customers or people who are being interviewed for jobs, not general walk-up traffic. Um, but what was key was when we looked at where the biggest volume of traffic was, it was the exact same offices that we included on the um, uh, first floor of the proposed uh, 100 Route 6A layout. So, um, for example, the town manager's office, the uh, treasure collector's office, the assessing department, all the inspections offices, and the town clerk's office are all on the first floor of the proposed uh, layout for the building. Um, and those were the departments that got the most walk-up traffic. So it makes sense that those places uh, that serve the most people are on the first floor to help with customer service. Yeah, and hopefully we can kind of just show that image in just a moment, I think I lost my projector capability. Yeah, yeah. But what's the experience when you walk into the uh, you know hypothetical new yeah. 100 Route 6A? Um, I know that we've kind of yeah. circulated some some layouts. Let me do Good. it. Yeah. Sure, so if when you walk in the front door, the main floor of, of what used to be the bank, uh, when you immediately when you walk in, uh, there's a sort of a central, I don't want to call it a hallway, but almost like a central vestibule area. Uh, immediately to your right is a combination treasurer collector's office and that's probably one of the best examples of the improved efficiency and effectiveness that we were talking about earlier you know right now treasurer and collector are literally in two different buildings and we did have the ability in the past to combine that position so now we have a single joint one person who is the treasurer and collector so he literally has to run back and forth between two buildings and obviously can never be in the same place uh, two different places at the same time. So the benefit of when you immediately walk in that front door to your right when you have the treasurer and collector's office is, for example, if it's a very busy time in the tax collector's office, some of the treasurer staff can help at the window and help with customer service. Conversely, if the other is happening, if it's busy with the treasurers and a little quieter with the tax collector's office, the tax collector staff can help. That's just one example. So immediately to your right is the treasurer collector. As you go uh, around uh, around the space counterclockwise, the next office is the assessing department. And there's a, a one a joint counter where you can conduct business, and behind the counter, there's no wall there, so the staff can you know, work cooperatively together. As you keep going around, directly in front of you now are all the various inspections offices. So those are the departments that, were, that are currently at 16 Jan Sebastian Drive, the building inspector, board of health, um, natural resources, etc. Those are all the inspections offices directly in front of you. As you continue to go around, say to 9 o'clock, if we're looking at a, a clock face, uh, in that left corner you'd see the town manager's office and the board of selectmen's office, and then completing the circle back toward the front of the building is the town clerk. Uh, so again, right, in, right when you walk in the door, as Bud indicated earlier, earlier you have all the most high-traffic departments, tax collector, treasurer, uh, assessing, inspections, and town clerk, and of course, top level management and selectmen oversight uh, in there as well. Yeah. And one of the things that's interesting, because this was a bank, it actually already has the legally required vaults that we would need to install if we built the building. Granted, they might be a little bit bigger than what we need, um, but there's two very large vaults that are already in place in that building for yeah. our use. That's True. a really good point, and there's actually a couple of extras we don't need, so one, you know, <laughs> some of the plans are to get rid of the smaller ones. So. Right. Yeah. Um, and then that building is uh, completely fitted out in the basement. It has a finished basement that's been that way for quite some time. So some of the departments that are kind of less traffic departments that aren't interacting with the public quite as much, they would be located in that lower section of the building. That's right. So the, you know, I, I should stress with all of this that you know, n the exact layout and plan is not set in stone. We haven't had final design done with an architect yet. The purpose of what we've done so far is we called it a test fit, just to make sure everybody could fit. So we know that the departments we talked about on the main floor will fit there, and the other departments that can fit on that bottom floor would be human resources, accounting, planning, engineering, and IT. And uh, as Bud just mentioned, that makes the most sense. You know, they tend to have less 
you know, walk-up traffic from the public compared to the other departments that are on the main floor. And then what about the outside of the property? So I know we've looked at kind of adding enough parking yeah, to make sure that we can accommodate staff and vehicles yeah. and visitors. Yeah, I think from the initial look that we did in terms of the site plan itself, a uh, couple primary things we need to address is, one, if you've ever been in a bank building, there's a, quite a large drive-through area that would uh, come off the building that would enable us to put in another 40 additional parking spaces. So that's huge because not only for uh, public access and uh, uh, the public being able to park there, but a lot of the departments, particularly those at Jan Sebastian, meaning the inspections offices, have town vehicles. And so we need a place to park the town vehicles as well. So the proposal is that we would add 40 parking spaces, uh, you know, working with our DPW uh, to increase that on the exterior of the building. Um, if you've driven by the property lately, within the last year, year and a half, they added a full size generator, which is huge for the amount of times that we have to activate in storms or emergency management purposes. And so that generator is fully capable of running the whole building, which is really important. And another thing we're looking at doing because of the basement um, has poor, relatively poor access to the outside in terms of uh, uh, safety features. We're looking at possibly doing like a recessed area um, where there would be stairs to come down from the parking lot to the lower level that not only would allow some natural light in, but it would be a much safer ways to access the basement and to provide a secondary means of egress. Right. And that's all included in our budgetary cost estimates. It is. And may I'll just add, as Bud mentioned, the extra 42 parking spaces, that would bring the total number of parking spaces on site to 109. So it's a good amount of parking for the use we're proposing. Yeah, it certainly is. Let's just say if you've ever tried to get a parking spot at Town Hall <laughs> in the summer, you uh, take your I life in your hands when you go to lunch every day. <laughs> yes, I, I understand. <laughs> yes. With my regular stops there. Yeah. So, um, you know, we talk about $3.95 million for this project. Sounds like a lot of money. And I know, you know, we've seen other projects happen. I went out and kind of used Google and found other projects that were happening. What similar projects exist in the Commonwealth and what do they cost? Yeah, so uh, you, you did bring a couple to our attention that we weren't aware of and some of them we were familiar with. But the town of Plymouth, our neighbor, uh, just to the uh, northwest, just did a, a pretty large 60,000 square foot uh, complete renovation of a building with some additional uh, new space added for $40 million. And again, we're talking about 15,000 square feet for under $4 million. Uh, the town of Sharon, which was probably the most relevant in terms of the size of what they constructed, is very similar to what, what we're looking at, a hair bigger. They were at like 16,500 versus our 15,000 square feet. But for new construction, they were looking at 13.5 million, which was approved by their voters. And they looked at three different scenarios. That's the one they went with. Again, we're looking at 15,000 square feet for just under $4 million. Um, the town of Dennis just did an addition onto their former police station, which was a former uh, Chamber of Commerce building. Really? And, and that was like a 9,000 square foot addition, and it's costing more than what we're proposing to do here. And that was an addition onto an existing building. Um, and then I think it's important to remember and people forget the last major initiative to build a new central municipal building in Sam, which happened in the mid 1980s, and they were trying to build 40,000 square feet for $7 million. So again, 40,000 square feet for $7 million back in the mid 80s compared to 15,000 square feet for less than $4 million today. It really shows why this is such a unique opportunity. And in fact, I think the three of us would all agree if this didn't present itself and it wasn't, um, lack of a better word, so special for us to try to consider, we wouldn't even be contemplating this at this point. Yeah, it, it really is uh, incredible, the timing that's occurred. And, and the timing with, with the those, availability yes, of the building yep. and the availability of the funds. Mm -hmm. And then I just also personally, from a historical perspective, yep. find it a little bit serendipitous that in 1978, we bought the Town Hall Annex, which was the original Sandwich Cooperative yep. Bank when they moved to 100 Route 6A which yep. as their new headquarters. And, yep. and here we are, you know, 40 plus years yep. later, looking at effectively doing yep. the same type of project, but bringing all of our people together from all the offices. Yep. So I know there's been a, a few concerns that have, that have kind of rolled around about this project. Um, some folks are concerned about flooding. Some folks are concerned about um, traffic congestion. You know, and I know that we have some proactive plans to, to take a look yeah. at those things. And some of them, frankly, probably aren't concerns at all. 
Yeah, you want to just comment on those a little bit? Sure, I'll, I'll comment on those too. Maybe Doug can take the next ones. But the uh, flooding isn't a concern. The uh, flood elevation that's looked for uh, with current FEMA standards, Federal Emergency Management Agency, is an elevation of at least 14 feet above sea level. Um, that is more than 25 feet above sea level at the 106A property. So in short, if we're having water problems there, the problems townwide are going to be much, much greater than we, I think, any of us have ever imagined. So there really isn't any concern, any special construction we have to do because of where it resides relatively close to Route 6A, but certainly much, much higher up than most of the properties that are lower lying, including the uh, poli current police station and the downtown um, fire station. Um, in terms of traffic, um, without a doubt, especially in the summer, sometimes it's hard to get out of the the former bank property. The bank did exist there for many decades. It, it functioned well. Um, it may be that we have to look at something like right turns only when the traffic is backed up, uh, but most of the time it really isn't an issue. And I think most of our traffic in um, drive up capabilities seem to be spread out throughout the day. There's not just you know one small period of the day where there's a big rush of people. Um, so except for the commuting times, I would think it would, you know, it can easily be addressed or if we require people to turn right and find other ways to get back to 6A, that's possible as well. Yeah, I think one of the biggest questions I hear about this project is we have the wing school, it's sitting there, let's just move everything to the wing school. Why does a project like that not make any sense? I mean, the simplest answer is it would cost a lot more money. I mean, certainly anything's possible, it could be done, but instead of spending $4 million, we'd be spending $30 million or, or right. more. And so that, that's the simple why. answer. Right. Why does it cost $30 million to yeah. renovate the wing school? Right. Well, right. A, because the building's in terrible condition, let's be blunt, mm -hmm. and also it, it wasn't built for offices. It was built for classrooms back in the 1920s. Um, and to bring it up to current standards and codes, um, anyone who's been in the wing school, it has these weird half Half floor I spent levels. Many years in the wing school. You know the bathrooms are on half floors between each regular floor, and you know there's just no way, cheaply to make that accessible and to meet modern building right. codes. So it's, it's part a of the change of use effectively triggers all those codes. So fully ADA accessible end to end, fully sprinkled end to end, and even yeah. if we kind of cut off the back additions and and yeah. moved over to just focusing on the 1927 building, we're talking about a project that costs tens of millions of dollars right. easily. And you know, we, we do have, these aren't just our estimates, we didn't make them up. These were professional architects and engineers and cost estimators that documented this and we have all that information available on the town website. And the numbers are four years old, so, right. you know, so they're, they're, higher. they're higher than now than they were then. Right, and I think the other big yeah. conversation around this building obviously is, you know, what do we do about accomplishing uh, or fulfilling the need for a new senior center. And I know that the Board of Selectmen mm -hmm. has really uh, committed very strongly to moving that initiative forward um, based on urging from the COA, which, which really came about because of this project. And you know, we weren't expecting to, to pursue a, a new building for town offices, but right. it kind of fell in our lap. But I think that it's done a good job of advancing the need for the senior center and, and putting some real goals about how we're gonna make a definitive plan uh, this fall at a, a special town meeting. I mean, just for perspective, if you go into the bank building today, which, by the way, we have an open house this Saturday from right. 9 a.m. to noon on the 27th, so if anyone would like to come and take a look, um, several of us will be there to help answer questions, but people can just walk through the entire building. You'll quickly see that the, you know, there's offices already on the exterior walls, which makes sense, and there's more open areas in the middle to help provide that frontline service to uh, customers, uh, which is what all of our departments do. Um, if you think that there's 15 departments encompassing 51 year-round positions and the two departments at the Human Services Building today, you know, have six full-time positions and they have two part-time drivers. So, you know, how you would equate six or at the most eight people, two of which just drive, you know, aren't in the building much, part-time, versus 51 people who provide core municipal services that if financial Armageddon hit the town, there's certain services more than the schools we have to provide, and those are the ones that are located in that building. It, you know, it, it is the bread and butter of what towns do, and the senior services and community services that we provide are critically important, but I don't think they're as well served in a building like that as it could be in what they've talked about and what they've worked about for 10 plus years, you know, and, and the designs that we had uh, seen from them you know, really touted why they need special places set up for, 
more community type outreach for seniors and for others, not just uh, offices. Right, and I think you know it's putting the senior center into the 100 Route 6A property is really kind of trying to make do with something that might be available as opposed to putting together something that's really purpose built and, and fit for their needs that will last the community for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Um, my, my personal feeling is the 100 Route 6A property will have a lifespan as a senior center or, or community center, but and it's not going to have those features that I've seen in the concepts, which, which look really great. So, you know, I'd rather see us build a purpose-built facility that really checks off all the boxes for the long haul, haul and it's something the community can be proud of for a very long time. And I, and I got to say, I think that's one thing that the three of us have talked about a lot and the board has talked about is, uh, you know, if you think back 10 years ago, when Sandwich uh, went from 4,000 people in 1970 to almost 20,000 by the mid-90s, you know, we had to focus our new construction in terms of municipal buildings on school facilities. You know, in the early 70s, the high school didn't exist. We just had the wing school, which as Doug had pointed out, had been built on five different times. So we built the high school, we built Oak Ridge and Forestdale, we put additions on the high school, we put additions on Oak Ridge, we put additions on Forestdale. Not a single town building was touched or built with town taxpayer money until the police station was built, since the police station was built in 1975. So if you think about what the selectmen and the public, most importantly, have accomplished the last five or so years, we're building public safety facilities for police and fire, we've addressed our roads, we've done a lot with beaches, we've talked about trying to fix um, some issues at the boardwalk. Um, if we find a way cheaply to address central municipal offices like this and we look at a way of doing uh, senior services, community outreach and our library renovations and can find a way to retrofit the human services building for school central administration, you know, drop the mic, you know, we, our needs are met for the next 50 years. There might be some school needs that happen down the road but with the enrollments declining and most likely it's going to be, you know, fixing up what we already have, not building something mm -hmm. new. And the wastewater is the other big thing that we've done. So if you think about how far we've come in the last five years, when we basically completely ignored municipal operations and buildings for many, many decades, you know, the end's in sight and for relatively very short money we can get one of these things accomplished and then present what the boards talked about in the fall to the voters about the library and the senior community center. Th those things are huge and we're that much closer to being done. Right. And another opportunity to fulfill a need without going to a debt exclusion which would impact taxes. Right. And just as we're mentioning taxes, I think one of the other things I've heard uh, quite a bit is, you know, acquiring the 100 Route 6A property will take it off the tax rolls. And, you know, yes, it will do that, but at the same time, we'll be returning the Town Hall Annex and the Jan Sebastian property to the tax rolls. It's very likely the Jan Sebastian property would be further developed and have a higher value than what it would otherwise, um, certainly from when the town acquired it in the early 90s. And also I think it's worth noting the property that we're trying to acquire at 100 Route 6A, it's been for sale. It's been vacant for, you know, almost two years now. So if there was some really dynamite, high-end, you know, commercial use that was viable, it would have been uh, done by now, and it's just not there. And you think about some of the efficiencies we might be able to achieve once we see how offices work. And I think it's important to not make rash judgments, but, you know, see how things function. You know, there can be job sharing, you know, when certain positions become vacant, maybe they're not as necessary to be replaced. I mean, there's savings we can do that dwarf the tax payments that came from that property. Right. And I honestly see that as one of the largest opportunities. So, you know, being able to take advantage of, you know, spare capacity that you would not be able to otherwise take advantage of based on geography yeah because uh, people are just too spread out I mean a huge example is you know when when taxes are being paid or uh, beach and dump stickers are being sold at the annex sold at the annex and they don't have enough people and we have part-timers in there trying to cover the thing if one of the offices wasn't as busy on the first floor they can go help sell those stickers that's huge that's something we would do by nature but we're not able to do when we're in so many different buildings spread throughout town right so I think I think we've covered a lot of good information I think we've covered um, a lot of the, the facts here, the high-level facts on what this initiative looks like. Um, it's a, it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for the Town of Sandwich to be able to accomplish a real municipal office consolidation, especially at this price point, the 3.95 million. You know, if we look at those comparable projects, um, this is really a steal. And I, I'm not trying to um, minimize the amount of money that we were spending, but um, having the availability of the revenue from the power plant to be able to, to really do this in a single shot with very little taxpayer impact is uh, significant. Um, you know, being able to liquidate 
really what's going to amount to problem properties uh, for the taxpayers uh, as they exist today because we're going to have to invest in those, which really doesn't make any sense to continue to invest in an operating model that's a bit disconnected. Yeah. Um, you know, that also makes a lot of sense too. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm personally very excited about the opportunity. Um, hopeful that folks are going to come out to town meeting on our, uh, May 6th, uh, May 6th town meeting, Article 1, and support the Municipal Office Consolidation and Acquisition of 100 Route 6A. Are there any other pieces that you gentlemen would like to, to add that maybe we missed? I would just reiterate, you know, the customer service, the internal efficiencies, and most importantly, being to pay for it with one-time funds without any recurring costs on the taxpayer. And truthfully, by taking the money from the unit number three payment and the rest from our certified free cash number, there literally is not, in terms of someone's tax bill, anything that's going towards the purchase. And we will never be able to do this again this way. That's what I was going to say. If right. we're ever going to accomplish this objective, this is the most financially responsible, cost-effective way to get it done. It's true. It's, it's truly a one-time opportunity. Okay. Well, we thank you for uh, watching today. Um, I hope that you've, you've been able to learn a lot about what this project is about and what it means and, and what its potential future impact would be for the town of Sandwich. Um, if there's questions that you still have, feel free to give any of us a call at Sandwich Town Hall or you can email us, uh, selectman at townofsandwich.net and we will all get a copy of that. Town meeting is on Monday, May 6th at 7 p.m. in the Sandwich High School Auditorium. Um, this will be Article 1. So uh, we're certainly asking for your support and we hope to see you then. Thank you so much.